Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Hubert Dreyfus, who is Professor of Philosophy at UC Berkeley. His many publications include Why Computers Still Can't Think and On the Internet. He recently won the Barwise Prize of the American Philosophical Association, an award giving, given for bringing philosophy and the study of computers uh, under one uh, roof. And he is a past president of the American Philosophical Association. Bert, welcome to the show. Thanks, Harry. Where were you born and raised? Oh, in the middle of nowhere, Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh -huh. And uh, I was there for 17 years without realizing there was an outside world. Aha, uh -huh. and looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, only in kind of reaction. They were, they, I lived in this kind of literally vacuum. They didn't read books, they didn't listen to classical music, they just went to the Hollywood movies that were there in the theaters. And uh, so I sort of, everything I did when I read a good book or listened to music, it had the added advantage of seeming like a radical world, new world and a kind of reaction to them. Uh, but I would have been stuck there forever if it hadn't been for a debate coach at, uh, in high school who always thought that her good debaters should be sent to Harvard. But she hadn't sent any for a while because I guess she hadn't had any. But she insisted that I should go to Harvard. I never heard of Harvard. I thought it must be in England because it was in Cambridge, which I <laughs> thought must be in England. And so, now I wanted to go to MIT. I was interested in science. I had great fun blowing up things, making bombs and so forth when I was uh, hanging around in, in undergrad, well, in high school, in junior high school particularly. Was this a rebellion against all the, uh, the monotony? <laughs> Maybe. I guess it was. At the time, I just thought how cool you can make these bombs and set them off with electrical wires from a distance and all that. And I wanted to go to MIT because I figured they would enable me to make better bombs. But in the end, I... I don't think I quite flipped a coin. I just did what this debate coach said, and I went to Harvard, and then I and, discovered and what the real did, what, world. And, and at Harvard, what, what did you major in? Uh, physics. I was still trying to understand. I mean, I loved science. I, I wasn't making bombs. I was making poison gas and other things in the house. <laughs> and so I wanted to do science. But in the end, after, I just sort of wandered into a philosophy course, I think because I needed a distribution requirement, and it was C.I. Lewis, who I now, in retrospect, realize was the famous philosopher of the time, giving a course on Kant, who was certainly the famous philosopher of all times, and I was just stunned and switched to philosophy. Mm -hmm. what, what, in looking back, what do you think was the difference in physics and philosophy that made the one more attractive to you? Ah, hmm, hmm. I guess relating it to, to real, the real world and to people's lives, mm -hmm. uh, I, it, they seem in such different dimensions I can hardly compare them. They mm -hmm. were both fascinating and different. But I really, I guess I wanted to understand myself and the world I was in, and physics is about a, the universe. It has nothing to do with me or with the world mm -hmm. or even the cosmos. It's just different. Now, you mentioned b before we started the interview that you had had dyslexia uh, as, a, as a young person, even today. I, did, did that impact at all, this, okay. uh, well, this, this movement to philosophy? Yes, in a way. I think it may have even influenced the movement to science. It was clear that I couldn't go into history or English or anything where you had to read a whole lot because I read. I thought I was reading fine, but at that point I, no, I hadn't noticed that I read half as fast and I had, that I could hardly understand foreign language when I saw it, although I could speak it if I heard it. Anyway, I think, uh, so I had to go into something that was not requiring much reading, and physics was surely one of them, just equations. But philosophy is funny because Kant, you can only read at 10 pages an hour. That's probably too <laughs> fast, maybe five. And Heidegger, too, who has my favorite now. So it doesn't matter if you're dyslexic. It's almost an advantage because you've got to slow down. And so that influenced me, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you got your BA at Harvard in what year? 51. And then uh, there was a long period before you completed your uh, dissertation. 
Uh, tell us about that because you were learning a lot during that period, right? I mean, yeah. what, what, what were you doing? You were teaching, at a, teaching philosophy at MIT? Right. Okay. And I, I, I needed a problem. I think it's important, I keep telling students, that you can't write good papers or theses if you haven't got a question. And I wrote my undergraduate honors thesis on causality and quantum mechanics, sort of shifting from physics to philosophy. I really wanted to know whether the contemporary physics had proved that Einstein and Kant were wrong, thinking you have to have strict causality or you're not talking about reality. Mm -hmm. And I worked on it for a year trying to figure out the answer to that. And uh, then when it was time to do a PhD, I didn't have any question. And I didn't have anybody who was even sort of helping me find any question because mm -hmm. I was, how I, for reasons I don't know, I was never interested in the mainline philosophy, sort of normal science of philosophy that my grad, fellow graduate students were in. It seemed to me utterly boring. It was, I think now everybody thinks that analytic philosophy in the 50s and 60s was utterly boring. And, uh, but there, nobody could sort of point me in any other directions. So luckily I got a traveling fellowship and I went and listened to Jaspers in Basel and Heidegger followers in Freiburg and saw that there was this other way of thinking about things and that that helped but still I really didn't have any topic so I graduated in 51 and I didn't write my thesis till 64 mm -hmm. and meanwhile teaching at MIT and it wasn't a good thesis I've never published it because although people ask me to it was on Husserl who I think is unfortunately boring a, a boring philosopher and it didn't answer any question, mm -hmm. uh, but when did I get the question? Oh, well, yeah, I got a question, and that may change my life and career. At MIT, I was teaching the usual stuff, and luckily at MIT, the students were coming over from what was called then the robot lab, and is now called the artificial intelligence laboratory, and saying, oh, you philosophers, you've never understood understanding and language and perception. You've had 2,000 years, and you just have keep disagreeing and getting nowhere, but we over in, with our computers and are making programs that understand and, and solve problems and make plans and learn languages and when we do that, we'll understand how it's done. Mm -hmm. And I thought, gee, I want to be in on that, but I don't think they can do that because Heidegger and Wittgenstein, who I was reading, say that you can't uh, intelligence doesn't consist of following rules and their stuff is all rules mm -hmm. so then I was interested okay so you had a problem and we're going to talk about that problem in a minute yeah. but I want to go to a different place with you because I think there's some interesting things that I want to walk you through first you had a recent interview and you, and you said to the interviewer that there is somehow in the universe this power to grab people and motivate them to do great things that doesn't come out of their inner something or other and doesn't come out of their culture. Uh, we don't know what it is, but people call it a calling. So you're, you're calling, so I, I want to re reflect a moment. You, you've led us to coming to philosophy. What do you see in your background that led to that okay. calling? Or was it the, the, the problem that interested you? Yes, I think it was always the being grabbed by a problem, and that's close to a calling. But it, I think my calling is being a teacher, and, uh, and that's, that's different. I mean, I don't think, I don't get my identity from philosophy or from solving or at least pushing ahead on these issues like what computers can and can't do. Uh, so at the, the, the real thing was, when I became a teaching assistant, I suddenly discovered that I could throw myself into a discussion section so completely that I hmm. literally forgot where I was. And for about an hour afterwards, I was sort of wandering around in a daze because it was just so fascinating. And it's been like that ever since. I still put so much energy into teaching and I still just sort of forget where I am. I mean, I'm sure that anybody in flow doing whatever they do feels it. And that was a calling. I, give, I have a clue, if you want to know where I think I got it. Mm -hmm. I have a hunch that people who are teachers probably have younger siblings. I mean, I got credit for teaching my younger brother and, uh, and not 
hitting him, but helping him. And, and I was, so I was a teacher from the age of three, I think. Be interesting to study. I, w I wish somebody, if somebody maybe hearing this will go look, whether people who win teaching awards are older siblings. Mm -hmm. I have a hunch. You, you said, actually, it's something that you gave me to read, that, that at a certain point you were somewhat disappointed or frustrated when your younger brother uh, was born, and that you, you basically said you, you, you almost felt a kind of nothingness, and that therefore you no longer uh, had anything to prove, and therefore you were ready to risk everything. Is yeah, that? Yeah, that's right. I mean, th this is a kind of... Uh, Heideggerian way of thinking way before I had come across Heidegger that there are most people around who believe I guess it's hard for me to remember what it would be like to believe it because I must have lost it at the age of three that there is an intrinsic meaning in things and that you get sort of credit for what you do by way of the approval of people and that they know what's good and what's not and this whole idea that uh, and that you can just sort of earn credit by doing what one does, the appropriate thing, it, and so forth. And uh, I think I sort of lost that when, when all of a sudden my world was smashed by the, some little baby who seemed to be getting as much credit or more than I did. But going through that kind of despair, one might call it, Heidegger called it anxiety, which was a, but in a very special meaning of anxiety, that where you discover that nothing has any intrinsic meaning, then that frees you up to hear the call and to respond to whatever calls you. I guess I can connect that with graduate school. While everybody else was charging along seeming to know what they should do to get a job and what they should read, I had no clue, but I read all kinds of weird stuff that nobody else read. And on the qualifying exams, nobody could really grade my qualifying exam because <laughs> it was about stuff they'd never read. And uh, my thesis on quantum physics was read by Quine, who is a logician and really I don't think had any particular, no particular about quantum physics. You know, every, I was always just, doing what the situation required. And the ultimate, back to computers, uh, nobody else in philosophy was paying any attention to these people who were claiming in, that they were using their computers to understand the, the mind. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it, I heard it, it grabbed me, and I just started doing it, and there was no other philosophy on the subject. That's all, that was all right. I read the AI people's stuff. Mm -hmm. and. Um, artificial intelligence. Yeah, artificial intelligence, things that they published. And, yeah, that's, that's the way it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you have, you have two vocations, uh, primarily a teacher, you just said, but you're also a philosopher. Let's talk a little about doing philosophy, and then we'll get to where, what you've done with philosophy. But, but, but what does a philosopher do? Okay, well, most of my colleagues in and a former graduate student friends and so forth so work at solving problems that have been around since Plato and Aristotle, like the nature of time and space and causality and so forth. And there's always some view, and perception was a big one when I was a graduate student. And then there's some reigning view, and everybody tries to defend it, and other people attack it, and everybody gets their publishes stuff and gets promoted on the basis of how well they had defended and attacked it. It never interested me. Mm -hmm. uh, what interested me, again, was sort of trying to understand some issue that was around. And philosophers, I guess, have done that. I can't think of any right now who've done it, uh, but they must have. Uh, well, Kant was doing it. He was trying to understand how physics was possible, how mathematics was possible, uh, and so forth, given certain assumptions. Um, so for me, philosophy amounts to finding some interesting thing going on that it seems important to know the answer to, mm -hmm. and it gives you the equipment to do it by, uh, you learn to think clearly, to think of generalizations, to think of counterexamples, to answer the counterexamples. That's what all of these people were doing. Mm -hmm. But they, their con the content of what they were doing didn't interest me. The method was fine. Mm -hmm. Except, oh, another thing, I mean, it just so happens that there's this division between the philosophers who mainly think, it isn't using logic, that's too narrow, but 
but think analytically, as they would say, making claims and counterclaims and counterexamples. I think that's fine, but I got more and more called or pulled into phenomenology, where the important thing is to describe the experience involved in perceiving, in, in acting. This whole talk we're having about finding your calling is mm -hmm. phenomenology. You can't get it by analysis of, of concepts or uh, rules or uh, propositions and so forth. It's an experience. I, I made a, a note here that, that we're, it, it strikes me that as I listen to you and, and having read some of your, uh, your work that uh, there's a real focus on humanity, and, and the words that come up again and again are vulnerability, commitment, risk, and meaning. Uh, it was, is that a fair assessment of, That's of your right. work? That's so, right. So these are the, the problems within philosophy that, 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 that have preoccupied you. That's right, and that means there is a kind of minority strain in philosophy who were the people I was reading that nobody knew how to grade the, my exams, and that Kierkegaard, well, it starts with Pascal, who is the first to say that the human condition is just fundamentally contradictory. Uh, everybody in the Plato, Aristotle, Greek philosophy tradition had tried to find out what we essentially are, and then to say, well, you've got to do your essential thing, be rational, love the good and whatever, and discard the part of you that is going against that. And mostly it was the mind was the good part and the body was the bad part, so we were, and they thought we were essentially minds. And then Pascal goes around, comes around and says, no, we're essentially bodies and essentially minds, and they are in conflict in many ways, and we're stretched on this conflict, we like sort of crucified on the conflict, I picture it. Uh, we're, we, he says that great people uh, go to both extremes and fill all the intervening space. And, the, and they are constantly anxious and, uh, because it's impossible to get all this, what it is to be a human being together. Mm -hmm. and they don't even take risks. I mean, they just, it, it just happens that their life is a kind of risk. And, and so Pascal starts this all by himself, a kind of genius. They're annoyed responding to Descartes, who was mm -hmm. one of the, we're just minds and we will just retire from mm -hmm. all, our, our bodies are just another object and we can get along without them. And Pascal broke with that in 1670 or something, roughly. And then Kierkegaard, way later, in 1850, took it up again. And I was very interested in Kierkegaard, because he says explicitly the self is a contradiction for him between the finite and the infinite, the temporal and eternal, the possible and the necessary, but it could also be the body and the mind, mm -hmm. uh, except, well, for the for this discussion, that would, he thought that he thought the body-mind distinction wasn't a good one because it leads people to think that they could have one without the other. Whereas you've got to see that these two factors that are not only there in conflict but they are necessary for each other at the same time. So anyway, I got interested in that. And and, and I and, and up until the present, where it, we're going to be talking about this, you 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 seem to be very much. Uh, uh, influenced by Merleau-Ponty, actually, right, right. Uh, in in terms of uh, the, the 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 statement that, in a way, uh, helps you understand and, and define what it is to be human, basically. Not that, really. Not, not Merleau-Ponty. No. Yeah. Well, it's it's Merleau-Ponty is a kind of spin-off from Heidegger. It's Heidegger who takes up Kierkegaard. By the, we should go back one minute to Kierkegaard. Yeah. He's got the notion of calling that, that, that I've got, that you are called to have what he calls an unconditional commitment mm -hmm. or an infinite passion for something. And only by that can you get these seemingly contradictory factors together. And, but that puts you at a terrible risk because you could always, if, you're, if your commitment is to somebody, they may leave or die. If it's to some cause, it could fail. If it's to being a teacher, say, I could be struck uh, dumb and not be able to talk, and then there'd go the teacher business. So uh, it's always a risk. And then Heidegger just took up from Kierkegaard this whole idea of a calling and of, of the uh, holding on to anxiety, which for him, 
He gets everything from Kierkegaard. That's already in Kierkegaard. But in Heidegger, it means seeing that nothing has intrinsic meaning, that there are no guidelines that you can follow, it, that it, it, you can follow them, but then you will have a life that is banal and standard and routine. Mm -hmm. Kierkegaard calls it leveled. But if you're going to respond in a lively, a live way to the particular situation you're in, then you've got no guidelines. The guidelines will level you to the standard way of doing it. And Heidegger takes that up and calls it being authentic. And uh, so, so that's why. I mean, that resonated with something in mm -hmm. my life. I don't know what exactly. It, and it resonated with the story about skills and what it is to have a skill. Mm -hmm. And that's where my brother comes into this. I mean, he's, he's always around in the background. But long after I was teaching him, he was teaching me. He's, he's a philosopher, too. No, he's a professor here uh, of yeah. industrial engineering. Oh, okay. But he's a better philosopher, but not a philosopher exactly, but a better phenomenologist than most of the philosophers. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point, Point. All, all kinds of things happen by sort of luck, by the way. I think that's a, a real factor. I mean, it was luck to be at MIT, and then it was luck to be here, and one day a guy showed up who turned out to be from the Air Force and who wanted, because I'd written this book, What Computers uh, Still Can't well, can Do, it was called in those days, he thought that I would help him fight the Air Force belief that to become an expert you had to learn rules mm -hmm. and to test if you were an expert they would test to see if you still remembered the rules. And this mm -hmm. guy, Jack Thorpe, uh, would thought that was wrong and that I would support him and give him outside uh, authority. And so it, it turned out he, that the Air Force paid for me to think about skills, but I didn't know how to think about skills, so I got uh, my brother Stuart into it, and he started thinking hard about skills, what it was. We, we decided we would think about what it is to become a driver, and then, because uh, I had said to Jack Thorpe, that's right, I can't do this because you want to know about pilot skills, and I don't know anything about pilots or planes. And Stuart said, that's all right, we'll talk about drivers and cars, and when we turn this into the Air Force, we'll just substitute pilots <laughs> for drivers and airplanes yeah. for cars. It's, and it worked. The Air Force loved it, and it showed this kind of generality of the skill story. And the skill story has all, built in it from my brother's side similar things to what I've been telling you. That you start, if you start out with rules, you will just be, and you have to, because mm -hmm. if you're going to learn a new skill, then you will, learn, you will just be doing a routine sort of thing. You know, mm -hmm. Like drivers will learn to shift when the speedometer needle mm -hmm. points at 10 miles an hour. And we can relate this as you yeah. go into this. Let yeah. me interrupt you one second yeah. because the next thing I wanted to ask you was uh, you, you said that your main vocation is as a, as a teacher. So let's talk about skills, which you've already started doing, but related to, to what is involved in making uh, uh, teaching a, a calling and that's, doing it well. That's interesting. Uh, because teaching is a peculiar, is peculiar, but not probably so peculiar, but in that there isn't really anybody telling you the rules to start out with. Uh, whereas if you're a driver or a chess player or most things, when you're a grown-up, you, you start by being told what are the things you're supposed to pay attention to and what are you supposed to do when these things happen. And, but nobody told me that about teaching, and I'm very suspicious if anybody goes around mm -hmm. trying to tell anybody that about teaching. Uh, it would be a kind of trap, because you might you know, just get stuck there. People mm -hmm. get stuck in this kind of what I would, uh, Stuart called, uh, being just competent, mm -hmm. which means following the normal rules and doing the normal things. Well, in philosophy, there aren't any normal rules. So in learning philosophy, you're sort of like a child, which all, who also at first has to just do it and see what, wor what works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. So there I was doing things. I started out, I think, very badly as a TA at Harvard. I had in mind exactly what I wanted the students to learn and to say. Mm -hmm. And I had a sort of plan for the whole hour. And all this energy that I felt and intensity was to make sure that they got exactly where I wanted them to get and exactly the time I wanted them to get there. I think that was, a, that was not quite the way to do it. You gotta take advantage of the accidents that come along and follow out with them follow them too so anyway so 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 uh, yeah. uh, let, let's, let's pursue yeah. this a minute yeah. so in this in the, in your role as a teacher the the process in a way you're learning in a way the, the students are witnesses to your learning 
That's what I think. That's yeah. I think. That I'm told again and again by one outstanding teaching award at MIT and here that what I do is I involve the students in what's a, what a joint process of learning, and I'm not faking it. I'm always learning, mm -hmm. and to do that, this just. Again, you don't figure these things out, they just happen. I didn't say to myself, ah, mm -hmm. teaching is really learning. Oddly enough, Heidegger says exactly that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I just wouldn't want to teach if I wasn't learning something at every lecture. And of course, it's great luck to be at a place like Berkeley where there are very smart students who usually understand this better than I do in some aspect or other, even after 30 years. So, and, and so you're learning, that's one important thing. But another thing I was going to mention is this business back about risks. Uh, you have to just take a risk. You're there in front of the class, and if you get it wrong, you don't want to be embarrassed or defensive or try to browbeat the students into thinking you're right like some of my colleagues do. Uh, I think I'm really teaching well when I come in the next lecture and spend the first 10 or 15 minutes at least confessing the things that I got wrong and that the students in office hours and in the lecture were on the right track. And that's, I think that's important for them to see that. But I don't do it because it's important for them to see it. I do it because I have to s straighten out what I messed up. So you've got to be able to take the risks. And you don't want to ask yourself, so what's a rule that will enable me to keep from making that mistake next time? This is a very important idea of Stuart's, which I think nobody else has. People think, and you read about it, if something goes wrong, you try to formulate some kind of rule that says don't do that sort of thing in that sort of situation again. And then you try to follow that rule. Well, that will make you, again, rigid and routine and standard, mm -hmm. and you'll be stuck at competence. So what should you do? Well, this is what Stuart says, and it probably is right. You simply feel bad about your mistakes and feel good about what works and dwell on that. The really great uh, anybody's basketball players or uh, mm -hmm. musicians or what say that they do that, that they... and. I know in teaching I do it. I didn't do it because of it, but uh, I have this peculiar habit, which I now understand thanks to the skill story that Stuart told. I've always taped my lectures, and then when I'm going to give the lecture again the next year on that subject, I listen to the previous lecture. I'm running around, now it's on my uh, iPod. It used to be on my Walkman and, or <laughs> in my car, wherever. I'm always listening to my previous lectures. None of my colleagues do that. I'm doing it and I'm saying, wow, I did that right. That was great. Boy, did we get that right. Or, oh my goodness, we, I'm following this terrible path and it's going very badly. But I'm not looking for the rules to prevent it. And somehow, if you just do it, if you just take the risk and suffer the consequences and feel good about the results, it tunes the neural net in your brain mm -hmm. and, you, and you're not stuck with rules and mm -hmm. you get so that you can respond to each particular situation in a way that mostly works. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't work, that's all right too because that's how you learn. Mm -hmm. And so the skill story and the risk and the calling and the teaching and the, all fit together and if, you, if it weren't for philosophy, I suppose nobody would see that they fit together. My brother's report to the Air Force would still just be resting there on the desk for the Air Force. Mm -hmm. Whereas I put it together with Heidegger and now comes Merleau Ponty. Yeah, right, that's, that's what, what I was just going to say. So let's go back to Merleau Ponty. Okay. Okay. Well, Heidegger's the important one, and you've got to say. I mean, he saw that what Kierkegaard was saying in a Christian context in 1850 in Denmark was some deep important thing about what it was to be a human being that nobody had seen and wrote Being in Time, which now I think practically everybody thinks is the great book of the 20th century philosophy. And a famous philosopher named Habermas, who really hates Heidegger, has said grudgingly, I presume, that, mm -hmm. uh, that the Being in Time is the be greatest philosophy book since Hegel's Phenomenology mm -hmm. of Mind. And the way you can tell it's great, Merleau Ponty will show up in this in a minute, is that all the people who are important in what's sometimes called continental philosophy, not analytic, not Anglo-American, are Heideggerians of some sort. So Sartre took, was the first to take over Heidegger. Being in nothingness is a, a brilliant misunderstanding of being in time from a French Cartesian perspective. And Michel Foucault said that everything, that he, that he was a Heideggerian on his deathbed, he said that Heidegger was the main influence on him. Uh, 
let's see, a Bourdieu, Pierre Bourdieu, who's a very important French thinker, said to me his first love in, in philosophy was Heidegger. There's another one before we get to Merleau-Ponty I was thinking of. We'll come to that in a minute. Let's okay, let's go to Merleau-Ponty. Merleau yeah. So Merleau-Ponty reads Heidegger and sees that it could be transposed into a talk about scale and perception and how you respond to the particular situation. And he takes out all the kind of existentialist the stuff I'm telling you about, anxiety, risk, uh, that doesn't interest him. What interests him is coping, how you are able to uh, be an expert and respond to the particular situation. And The Phenomenology of Perception is a brilliant book that goes against the whole philosophical tradition saying it, you don't need concepts, you don't need rules, they don't guide action, they don't organize your perceptual experience. There's, it's the way your body has of immediately grasping the, the gestalt of what's going on or failing to and then doing it better next time. So naturally now I teach the phenomenology of perception. Though I teach Heidegger every year, and I teach Merleau-Ponty maybe every two or three years, because it's very hard. Well, they're both hard. But Heidegger is the source. He just is where everything, it all comes from him. Now, in, uh, but l let's talk a little about Merleau-Ponty, because it, uh, I think this, this notion, which seems to me to be central uh, to your critique of some of uh, the, the uh, 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 balloon, I guess we would say, of what computers can do. It helps someone burst that balloon. Uh, and, and that is this notion of getting a grip on reality. Because uh, the, our dialogue here is, is really showing us the way in which you came to an understanding of the humanness of the individual, whether in learning or in acting, and how he, and, and I guess Merleau-Ponty's term, gets a grip on reality. Good, I see. Uh, uh, so mm -hmm. so let, let's pursue that a little, because in a way, it, it's not just about learning. It's not just what a, a, a distinguished doctor does in the surgery room, or what a, a pilot does, you know, when he's flying a plane and is, a plane and is confronted with an emergency. Talk a little about that, the element of this because the the assumption before you and 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 philosophers like you came along was the notion well there's a set of rules you know you go to the text you find the rule you know when the blood starts spurting out of the artery as you're operating you do such and such but much more is involved right well I never thought of it the way you were putting it putting these two together but I see now yes the basic idea in Merleau-Ponty is that we are always moving to get an optimal grip and now comes the place where he goes sort of beneath what Heidegger was doing he, even in perception just in perceiving say this table I mean I I am now at a comfortable distance. If I were up this close, I would sense that that was not the way to see it in, uh, at it in its best, getting a grip. To talk like Merleau-Ponty, he says, if, if you get too close, then there's too many details. If you get too far away, you've lost the overall, you, you, you lose the details. And he talks about how in a, in a museum, you wanna, your body is just led by a picture to move to the optimal distance where you see the maximum richness, as he puts it, of the detail and the maximum clarity of the form and where, uh, uh, well, period. And when you perceive ordinary objects, there's a further thing. You move around them and so forth and you are led by the object calling on your body. It's just outside of what your mind does or could do. The object just calls you to get in the best relation to see it. It always looks, if you're looking like at a house from the front, you also sense that you'd see it even better if you could also see the back. So what's fascinating about this is that for Merleau-Ponty, he's the first to see this, that normativity that is better and worse uh, as is goes down to the bottom of our experience it's in our perception of objects no philosopher i think has said that and skillful coping as the phrase i always am using is always being 
you, when you're skillfully coping in flow, without thinking, without rules, your body and its skills is drawing you to get this optimal grip on the situation. And, and the situation is always completely concrete. It's something that you've never been in before and the other people haven't been in before and you'll never be in it again because having been in it this time has changed you. Mm -hmm. So, but out of that, and Aristotle already saw that. It was lost, sort of, till Heidegger found it in Aristotle. And Aristotle says, if you, if you, if you keep acting and getting experiences and making mistakes and learning, you will finally become a phronimus, a person of practical wisdom, and that means you'll do the appropriate thing at the appropriate time in the appropriate way to talk like Aristotle. And that's, that's mastery. That's the highest thing you can get. So, does Merleau Ponty, I'm asking myself, ever talk about mastery like that or expertise? Uh, no, he's just, everybody has their own job. His job is to go beneath Heidegger and ground it in everyday skillful action and everyday perception. Uh, Heidegger goes to the other end and talks about mastery and uh, how you can become a person of practical wisdom. And even further than that, you can become somebody who changes the world by not just responding in an original way to the situation, but responding in a way that changes people's perceptions of the situation. Mm -hmm. that's, what's the, that's the highest thing you can do, according to Heidegger. Now, let's go pick up that first book that you wrote, which I will show our audience, which is called What Computers Still Can't Do. Now, but wait, stop. Can I interrupt? Yes, yes, please. The book was called What Computers Can't Do. There's a kind of joke in this third edition. Okay. I mean, it started out in 72 as what computers can't do, and it was second edition still, but now in whenever that came out, 93 or something, I put in the still. <laughs> okay, so, and which, which then uh, helps us relate it to its uh, recent uh, uh, mate, so to speak, uh, which is a book called On the Internet, which I will now show our audience. Now, uh, if, if I can simplify for our audience, uh, one could say that the thrust of your thinking in, in looking at cybernetics, which is the first, first book is about, and then the book on the internet, which is focusing on uh, the World Wide Web, uh, the, the notion, uh, the theme running uh, through the other side, so to speak, the people that you're opposing, is the notion that machines, or technology uh, manifested in forms such as the World Wide Web could replace humans, basically. That we are heading to that world in which there will be the howls of Stanley Kubrick's mu uh, uh, movie uh, uh, 2001. Uh, and, and you dismiss that basically, and, and you're drawing on all of these insights from philosophy that you just talked about. So, for example, let me read you, if I can find it, uh, in, in, in uh, critiquing uh, 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 things like virtual reality. You write, that you're, you're trying to, to describe what a machine or a technology cannot do, uh, and it, it, it is this kind of coping with reality that you've just described. And you write, two human beings conversing face to face depend on a subtle combination of eye movement, head motion, gesture, and posture, and so interact in a much richer way than ro most roboticists realize. Studies suggest that a holistic sense of embodied interaction may well be crucial to everyday human encounters, and that this intercorporeality as Merleau-Ponty calls it, cannot be captured by adding together 3D images, stereo sound, remote control, and so forth. So it's really the, the same theme that you're confronting in, in both of these books. Is that fair? Sort of. I, I, uh, the way we've come at it, I realized something that I didn't realize, mm -hmm. that what computers can't do is a pretty strictly Heideggerian book. And mm -hmm. that means it's mainly criticizing what people called uh, mental representations or mm -hmm. when they're in that the, the people must have had a model of the world in their mind in order to act on it and that starts with Descartes then the computer people 
took it over. And uh, now they, they talked about symbolic representations in the computer. And they said, Herbert Simon is the one who said it, that the, we are physical symbol systems, people and computers, because they have these representations and then they use rules to make inferences about what's going on in the world and what to do about it. And that, that's what struck me as wrong from a Heideggerian perspective, where we respond to the unique situation and we don't use rules, and Excuse more me. important for this so moment. Okay. We're going to have to do that question over again. Okay. Okay. Uh, Ran out of uh, tape or what? Uh, what, what, what have, uh, what, oh, oh, no. No, 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 just take up from that last question. Okay, okay, so, so is, there, is there a common theme in these books that you've written on uh, the, the, the limits of technology uh, that uh, requires us to bring in Merleau-Ponty at this point in the discussion again. Yeah, well, I see now, I hadn't really thought about it before, but the way the discussion has gone, there are really just two components. When I was at MIT teaching Heidegger, I was interested in the fact that the MIT AI people said that we had mental representations of the world, that in our mind there had to be a whole model of the world on the basis of which we could then make inferences and act. And the computer people said, well, that's right, we've just learned uh, how to do that. We have symbolic representations in our computers and inference rules that enable the computers to plan and to act. And now, there are several things to say about that. Uh, mostly, I thought that this was just wasn't going to work because Heidegger and Wittgenstein, too, had shown that meant the whole Cartesian mental representation way of thinking about the mind's relation to the world is wrong. In Heidegger jargon, we are just an open head, in effect, turned toward the world. We are directly in a dynamic interaction with the world and other people. We don't have this intermediate of a, of a representation in the mind. And so the, I predicted that the AI was going to fail. That was, AI being artificial intelligence. Yeah, right. AI, artificial intelligence was going to fail, and it now pretty well has failed. I started at a rand, that rand with a paper in 1965 called Alchemy and Artificial Intelligence, which is the mm -hmm. basis of the book. And uh, now my former students uh, call this old-fashioned, good old-fashioned AI, <laughs> GoFi, uh, the, this attempt to make what Oh, I forgot an important piece. The Simon said, and Herbert Simon, and this is you ask, are we machines or not? We are just like computers. They and we are simply, uh, what is it, physical symbol systems. That That's is, what Simon said. Yeah. yeah. In, our, in our brain, the neurons represent the world, and in the computer, the, the transistors or the, so the chips represent the world, and we're going to make... Simon said in, in 65 that in 20 years we'd have computers that would do everything that people could, could do. And, if, and I said they're not going to be doing anything that people can do. And mm -hmm. I won. I mean, good old-fashioned AI is out. Nobody does symbolic AI. Mm -hmm. or only one or two people. So, so Heidegger won that round. But then now here's where Marilyn Ponty comes in. The interesting feature of one of them, of being in time, is Heidegger does the whole destruction of the mental representation story and our interaction with the world without even mentioning the body. He mm -hmm. mentions it once and says, well, the body is an interesting problem, but we're not going to deal with mm -hmm. it here. Well, Merleau-Ponty sort of just filled that gap. Merleau-Ponty only talks about the body. He doesn't care about... The, in effect, you could say this, I see, that if you ask, well, what takes the place of mental representation, it's body sets to cope with things and to move toward the optimal grip. Mm -hmm. And now, and whereas Heidegger critique of mental representation is the way to bring down the claim of the artificial intelligence people that they understand uh, these issues better than we philosophers, there's a kind of little irony here. I mean, that when I started reading their stuff, I realized that they weren't, they had taken over philosophy. They had sort of bought it. Who had a, taken over? Okay, the people in the AI lab, I, I, see. With, I see, with their mental representations, you, yeah. had taken over Descartes and Hume and Kant, who I said see. concepts were rules and so forth. And the, far from teaching us how it should be done, 
they had taken over what we had just recently learned in philosophy was the wrong way to do it. It's, the irony is that in 1957, <laughs> When AI, artificial intelligence, was named by John McCarthy, it was the very year that Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations mm -hmm. came out against uh, mental representations. And Heidegger, already in 1927, that's being in time, wrote a whole book against mental representations. Mm -hmm. So they had inherited a lemon. They had just taken over this loser philosophy. And if they had known philosophy, they could have predicted, like me, that it was a research program. They took Cartesian modern philosophy and turned it into a research program and anybody who knew enough philosophy could have predicted it was going to fail. Mm -hmm. But nobody else paid any attention. That's why I got this prize. I, I saw what they did and I predicted it and that's the end of them. Mm -hmm. you, you write in, in, I think it's in the On the Internet book, you say, in cyberspace then, without our embodied ability to grasp meaning, relevance slips through our non-existent fingers. And you go on to say, That's the me. world is a field of significance organized by and for beings like us with our bodies, desire, interest, and purpose. Right. And that's, now that's where Merleau-Ponty comes in. None of that would be said by Heidegger. Heidegger was just interested in the way we could disclose the world without mental representation. But Merleau-Ponty sees that it is, there isn't anything mental about it. It's the, the, the basic level, our body and its skills for dealing with things and getting an optimal grip on things is what we need to understand. And then it becomes clear that computers just uh, haven't got it. They haven't got bodies and they haven't got skills. And now something you just read is important. The, the world is organized by embodied beings like us to be coped with you know, uh, by body beings like us, and the and if and the computer is just totally I mean lost in the world from the bottom up. It would have to have in it among its a model of the world and a model of the body, which they have tried, but it's certainly mm -hmm. hopeless. And uh, without that, they, the the world is just utterly ungraspable by by computers. And Mar so, but. but now I want to get from there to the issue which isn't computers. The, the way that Merleau-Ponty comes into it is, all, is through the body. And I got interested in writing this book about the internet because there it's no longer a con question of making artificial minds by using computers. Mm -hmm. Heidegger trashed it and it trashed itself. But it's now a question of people said, it's hard to remember, it's only maybe 10 years ago, the marvelous thing about the internet is that we don't have to have bodies on the internet. We, can, we are in cyberspace. Everybody is in touch with everybody else. Nobody's limited by their body, by how they look, by their local situation. I had a good friend, uh, I dedicate the book sort of to him, Nathaniel Goldhaber, who was an important venture capitalist who was saying, isn't it great we're going to be able to sell everything on the internet and see everything on the internet and all of it, our bodies will be irrelevant. And there were these people called extropians at MIT who said we'll become immortal because everything that's important about us is what we can transmit on the internet and everything else is just that mortal part of us, we can leave it behind. It's, uh, there was, so it was all this antibody hype and there's where Merleau-Ponty comes in, because in the quote you read, I mean, it's Merleau-Ponty says that it's our body with its skills which enable us to relate to things by going around them and relate to people by this interesting thing called intercorporeality, where I don't have to figure out from what you, your gestures and how you look what you're thinking and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I respond immediately with my gestures and my look. In, in Merleau-Ponty, that intercorporeality seemed to him magical. Whenever he couldn't explain anything, that was just his word for it. Now they've discovered something called mirror neurons, where it turns out that the same neurons in, in apes that pick up, uh, that perceive a certain movement, if I'm grasping for something, it's the case, also are the neurons who produce the movement. So that it's no accident that when you see me doing it, you do an appropriate thing. 
I mm -hmm. think of this myself. They never mention yawning, but yawning would be the clearest case mm -hmm. of this. Yawning is inter intercorporeality. Mm -hmm. And if things are boring and I yawn, you don't have to figure out what it meant. You can't help it yawn. Mm -hmm. So, so Merleau-Ponty has all the way the body is, as he puts it, geared into the world. And uh, that's, the, that's what the internet definitely leaves out. And I just have to put in another comment, a, a book I didn't show you because I didn't write it, but I published it in a sense. There was a fellow graduate student named Samuel Todas uh, that was very influential on me. I didn't mention him when we talked about my graduate but if I went into continental philosophy, it was also largely because I, he was the only one I could talk to. And, mm -hmm. But he has this idea that's very important, that the body has a structure. In Merleau-Ponty, you just hear always about the body is this capacity to act, to be open to the world, to go around objects. But Toda says, well, we've got a front and a back, an up and a down. Mm -hmm. We move forward more easily than we move backward. We, have to, we can't protect ourselves from behind. There's a lot to having a body that Merleau-Ponty doesn't see. Mm -hmm. And I, so I published Otis's book, Body and World, because it's, I think, the next stage uh, that people will have to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. I talked about it in my presidential address because, and all of this says that until computers could, which I don't think they ever mm -hmm. will, have bodies enough like ours and feelings like ours, they can't be intelligent. And now the internet we won't, if we were disembodied on the internet, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to acquire skills. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be able to see what was relevant and not relevant. We wouldn't uh, be able to uh, relate to other people. So the internet turns out to be a marvelous case of a kind of counterexample or experiment about what you can and can't do without a body. Mm -hmm. And I think sort of the book is all really all in a sense out of date. All this hype about how our civilization is going to be changed by the internet, we human beings are going to be changed, it's as important as the discovery of writing, it's all gone. I mean, the internet is like a very, very useful tool. It's like the telephone, mm -hmm. about as philosophically uh, interesting and important. They both are disembodied. And it's interesting how the phone is more embodied, because you can hear somebody, and how embodiment is creeping into the internet now. It, with Skype, my wife and kids are all doing international conferences now, talking to each other on the internet. Because clearly, talking is better than messaging, because the, there's the body in there, and it, 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 not fully, but mm -hmm. beginning to be. Mm -hmm. I have an idea here which may or may not work, but let's try this. So in a way, to get a, 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 the audience to understand you know, the, 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 the real kind of simple insight at the heart of what you're saying, in a way, our interview has been uh, an example of coming to terms with a reality. I had a, some ideas about where we would go, but it's, it's kind of in our action interaction in our sizing each other up that we're kind of embodying a kind of reality that you and 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 the people who have influenced you are writing about is that fair that's fair yes we any form of skillful coping in which the the ex, in which you can become an expert in which you get into a kind of flow in which you don't have to think at all your mind is out of it and the skills in your body are doing it uh, We've done all of that, and we've done it taking a risk, too, that when you do that, you may end up lost, or you may end up saying things you regret having said, and if you aren't ready to take that risk, you'll never become an expert in that. So I can predict that you have taken the risk, and you have done it and felt bad about it, and you've done it and felt good about it, and when you've got that, you've got this kind of mastery. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, in terms of my risk, I've been worried about the time, and I'm also worried about uh, uh, simplifying, you know, risking that we can simplify what we're saying so that a general audience uh, can understand it. Uh, uh, one final question. Uh, reflecting on your life and your work as a, a teacher and a philosopher, how would you advise students to uh, prepare for the future? Ah, gee. Uh, well, I do have something to say about that. I think that the, the last thing you do is make long-range plans and list sort of life possibilities and put and decide on, on, on what's called uh, what uh, 
rational choice theory or so, uh, and, and util, uh, uh, which of those is the rational thing to do. Uh, those are the people who get along and are competent and do normal whatever and standard whatever and routine. But I think that, that you have to just trust on luck and on this calling. And when something comes around, I mean, the, nothing I could plan could have fixed it so that when MIT people came to my course and said, we've done it over in the AI lab, that that was the way for 20 years my life would go. Mm -hmm. And if, it's, if I had plans, that would have only, I wouldn't even heard that. Mm -hmm. uh, and also a lot of luck. I mean, why, but you gotta, you can't, Force your luck, but when but when something like that is handed to you, you got to go with it. Uh, I'm my main worry is always people who think that they can sort of get a grip on the world by having principles, rules, plans, and so forth, and then they and I think that's partly because they're not open to the risk. It's a lot riskier to just throw yourself into something. I might have wasted 20 years, and they might have made intelligent machines, and I might have just looked utterly stupid. That's a chance. I, but I didn't ask myself, what are the odds? That would have been absurd. Something called me and grabbed me. So I guess my bottom line is be ready to take risks and be open to the thing that's trying to grab you and go with it. On that uh, really hopeful note, uh, Her uh, Bert, I want to thank you very much for uh, taking the time to be with us today. Thanks, Harry. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.